Hello and most welcome to 1760 already. I will today continue with David Egan's pictures in Wittgenstein's later philosophy. <clears throat> and we just uh, went largely into Baker. The challenge I put to Baker is reading the claims that pictures are empty. Now we discuss that. How can a misleading picture be empty? Well, maybe it's empty that it doesn't have a conceptual basis, but it can still run havoc without clearly pointing to something. So what Baker is saying is rather, Baker considers pictures empty in the sense that they are not subject to straightforward refutation. I think this is true. Wittgenstein is not interested in a proof if such a thing were possible. that words do not name objects, but if we look closely at the dialectic by which he engages with his interlocutor, we see the interlocutor not defending an empty claim. So much as a progressively emptying her claims in order to hold on to the picture that guides them. By briefly sketching some of the moves in the opening sections of the investigations, I hope to give some outline of this dialectic. The picture of the essence of human language that Wittgenstein gives us in the In Philosophical Investigation, paragraph 1 is this the individual words in language names name objects sentences are combinations of such names Far from being a basis immune to counterexample, we might object this picture is, is obviously wrong. Not all words name objects. And Wittgenstein says as much, you are, I believe, thinking primarily of nouns like table, chair, loaf, and of people's names, and only secondarily of the names of certain actions and properties and of the remaining kinds of words as, as something that will, will take care of itself. But in telling us what we are 
thinking primarily of in adopting the picture Wittgenstein is not exposing an error so much as exploring the nature of this picture what motivates it what lines of thought it encourages to assume that object must denote physical objects like tables chairs and loaves is already to apply the picture and Wittgenstein does not want to do so at this point. A defender of the Augustinian picture might well take propositions and conjunctions to be names for particular kinds of objects another application of the picture which would be immune to the complaint that not all words name physical objects but would certainly open up puzzles and problems of its own Here we begin to see how false pictures trend toward emptiness. We hold on to the initial picture only by broadening our conception of what an object is or what names are. are. Wittgenstein warns us that the broadening this conception too far risk emptying the picture we want to hold on to. If we say every word in the language signifies something signify something we have so far said nothing whatso whatever unless we explain exactly what distinction we wish to make That's from PI 13. To say that words signify something or name objects remains unclear. Until we specify what sort of something or objects we mean and what possibilities we at, intend to exclude in this specification he like he likens this claim to the claim that all tools modify Something well, very well, well put. <laughs> Thus, a hammer modifies the position of a nail and a saw, the shape of a board, and so on. And 
what is modified by rule a glue pot and nails our knowledge of things length the temperature of the glue and the solidity of a box would anything be gained by this assimilation of expressions what motivates the interlocutor's tenacity in holding on to the picture as it it is gradually emptied of content surely not the assurance that this progressively empty claim remains the basis for a plausible or rich theory of language what matters to the interlocutor here I claim is the notion of naming relation as the essence of language holding to this picture seems essential if language is to be about anything if what we can say in language can pertain in any meaningful way to the world Counter examples aside, the interlocutor cannot shake the sense that language would simply be unable to function if some sort of naming relation were not essential to it. In this respect, it is not the truth or falsity of a particular claims about how language works that concern Wittgenstein and his interlocutor. but a struggle over how we are even to begin conceiving of the phenomenon that interests us. By pushing on this picture, Wittgenstein is not trying to refute the picture but helping his interlocutor see how little work the picture is actually doing for her. The emptier a picture seems, the easier it is to get low get let go of it. Pushed to its conclusion, the picture may fail to express any definite thesis, but its emptiness does not prevent the picture from a definite role in the interlocutor's thinking.
treating it requires not refutation but conversion. Cabell's 1976 characterization of the investigation investigations as having the form of a confession seems particularly apt in this context. Conclusion. Let me sum up briefly before offering some closing thoughts. In this paper I have drawn attention to the pervasive use of pictures in Wittgenstein's criticism and suggested that while Wittgenstein does not use picture in a technical sense. The term does do argumentative work and that we can get a sense of what work it does by looking at what Wittgenstein says about literal pictures. I have argued that for Wittgenstein pictures are like organ, organizing myths or conceptual bedrock which play a substantial role in philosophical reasoning. They are not empty but also are not the sort of things for which for which Wittgenstein or his interlocutors can provide arguments or counter arguments of what traditionally sort of the traditional sort. His aim then is not so much to refute bad pictures as to lead us away from them in a process that I have suggested is more like a conversion. All this may well be true but it does not settle the question of how important pictures are for Wittgenstein. Surely we can grant that some philosophical confusion arises because we misapply misleading pictures but does that mean that all philosoph philosophical error arises in that way, in this way? Baker offers pictures as one of three elements in a provisional typology of remarks in the philosophical investigations alongside formulations of grammatical rules and extremely general facts of nature 
that explain the importance of certain concepts. Such as the suggestion at PI142 that we would not have much use of our concept of weight if objects kept changing their weight. Baker's caution is that we not confuse types here and in particular not take Wittgenstein to be providing a rule where he is in fact offering a picture. My aim here is not to assert that Wittgenstein has a philosophy of pictures so much as to stress the importance of pictures in Wittgenstein's thought. First of all, as an element of his later philosophy that has received far less attention than grammar and rules, second as being central to his methodological reflections, and third considered alongside other things Wittgenstein says about pictures leading to a particular way of thinking about his methodology. Wittgenstein is different from other philosophers. Not just in the way he approaches but in what he considers to be problems. For Wittgenstein, philosophy is not primarily a body of doctrine, where the goal is to advance the correct doctrine, and find fault in the false doctrines of others, but rather as an activity of thinking and living in general, in drawing attention to the ways in which we operate with pictures. Wittgenstein is not trying to correct our pursuit of that activity, rather inviting us to rethink this activity is to question our assumptions about what we are doing and why. How we apply pictures is intimately caught up in our forms of life and our understanding of their forms of life. A criticism based on the misapplication of pictures is a criticism that draws attention to confusions in our own self-understanding.
such confusions require a form of criticism that goes deeper than the pointing out of error and I claim that Wittgenstein's use of picture is meant to aspire to this deeper level and the deeper level I think that's the absolute main point here by not preemptively seeing a doctrine in language or that language has a general tendency or do a priori classical laws on grammar and words a bit like Chomsky's universal grammar we are all guilty of universalization it has become the habit of modern day but we must remember that that very tendency takes away what life is what understanding is we must be living in the real world where it's nitty and gritty where no fixed rules a priori decides all and everything that's one of the wish dreams that we need to get rid of in order to progress so Wittgenstein's picture theory is an invitation to further your understanding and progress in your daily living and in this instance I agree perfectly with Fisher Fisher is pointing to possibilities within language for liberation once we understand the ruling principle of the picture or how we feel obliged to bring it to forward or are so lured by it that we will conjure it up to reality just because of the very tempting picture that is presented for us and that it lies in language itself i say thank you very much and have a very pleasant day morning evening or afternoon bye bye for now